you're not going to learn anything from me. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my story and my journey. But before I do that, I said to, I mean, I was amazed by the complexity of this whole issue of medicine, of uh, Jean Munro's presentation and uh, Dr. Klinghart's uh, presentation. And it all becomes mind-bogglingly complicated, especially to me. And uh, Dietrich, you said you weren't going to stretch, stretch the cells, the brain cells. Well, if that's true, then my Lyme disease is way worse than I thought, because <laughs> you certainly stretched mine. But you also alarmed them. Um, I had heard of this electrosmog um, only this year, really, um, as a result of mercury toxicity and various other things I'm suffering from. And uh, so I said to my daughter, you know, after all that this morning, what, what, are you gonna, what am I going to say? And they said, it's ever so simple, Dad. You've sold millions of those mobile phones. <laughs> Just stand there and apologize. <laughs> so, so here I am. <laughs> The, the only thing I can say in mitigation, I'll say first of all, I am sorry. The only thing I can say in mitigation is if I hadn't have done it, somebody else would. And I suppose the second point is I had no idea that I was poisoning you all to death and me while I was selling them. But, uh, you know, this, uh, this Lyme journey, wow. Um, I, it's, I'm flabbergasted. I am absolutely astonished by what I've come across. I'm astonished by the medical rejection of this at top level. Completely astonished. <laughs> I'm, I am astonished that the medical profession, and I suppose I'm talking high up, but I know it propagates right the way down into your GP's surgeries. But I'm completely astonished at their ability to turn a blind eye on human suffering. When I, when I read all the, um, all, all the stories on my Facebook page, and I do read most of them, although nobody gets a response because I haven't got the time to do that, I do read all of them, and it, and it, it drives my knowledge immensely forward of course, in a non-technical way, although some of the articles you send me are very technical. But it, it exemplifies and drives home the level of suffering, the level of suffering. And I, I can't understand why the medical profession, starting at the top and working the way down, can't read and understand some of those issues. They're not all written by hypochondriacs. Some might, but they're not all. And I'm certainly not a hypochondriac, and I've witnessed the suffering with my own eyes across all my family. And I'll tell you a little bit about that story. Because I had, and this, this, this sounds very nepotistic, but I had the, I've, I've mucked the slide up, but anyway. I had the most charismatic six, seven, eight, nine-year-old son you would ever, ever see in your life. Unbelievably pretty, unbelievably talented, and unbelievably confident. If this was 12 years ago, and this room had got 20 times the number of people in, and I said to him, do you want to get up and sing, Rufus? He'd get up, and he'd knock your socks off with a range of music from, from uh, Maroon 5, or Justin Timberlake, you name it, and he'd get up there and he'd do it with the most unbelievable charisma and the most unbelievable um, confidence. And yet, two or three years later, one day I was trying to take him back to school on a Sunday evening, and suddenly he just cracked up. And he cracked up totally. And I thought this was just a bit of play acting at first, you know, that he just didn't want to go back to school. But over the next hour or two, it became so obvious to me how this was not just a fad or a fancy or a whim to manipulate. This was something more. I could have never, ever begun to realize at that moment how much more. Because from that moment on, 
Rufus deteriorated. He had more and more panic attacks, more and more anxiety, more and more of everything. We had counsellors, psychiatrists, um, positive things. I even got to, you know, I've got Lyme brain as well. So, but this is a great excuse now because every time I used to forget something, it was me, you know, it was my poor memory. Now it's Lyme, so it's a great excuse. It was the, uh, oh, Tony Robbins. Do you know Tony Robbins really inspired him? He did a great job. He inspired him and it moved him on a little bit for about a month or two. But then unfortunately, he just went straight the way back. And I could never understand why we couldn't make progress. We'd, make, we'd go perhaps two steps forward, but then we'd always go three back. And we'd keep going three back. And it got to the point where he was increasingly ill. And the mental illness turned into physiological symptoms as well. And you know, we, we just did not have a clue. I hadn't even heard of Lyme disease. I hadn't heard, never heard of it. Anyway, a most fortuitous stroke of luck occurred because I was starting to set up a international center for childhood disability called uh, Cordwell Children in Stoke-on-Trent. We'd already been treating children for all sorts of illnesses and helping them with their illnesses, and especially autism, for 15 years. And we'd, we'd helped probably over that period about 40,000 children. We decided to do it on a much bigger scale. And the main objective was going to be to prove to NICE that autism, autistic children could be treated, rather than the doctors propagating out that your child's got autism, there's nothing you can do. And that's what every parent told me. They went away from the doctor's surgery completely and utterly despairing with a black hole. So we decided we were going to take on this challenge and help all the children that we'd normally been helping, but try and convince the authorities to change the guidelines to show that autism could be treated. Well, as a result of that, we started uh, interviewing various professors and doctors around the country to uh, integrate them into our situation. And during one of those interviews, and we were talking about environmental, uh, environmental science and so on and so forth, and it became very, very clear to me that there was a huge link between uh, environmental issues and autism. I'd always sort of thought that, but this be drove it home. And so I ended up saying to these doctors, well, is it possible then that my son, who has the following illness, and I described the illness, this could be caused by the gut, this could be caused by toxins or, or sensitivities? And they said, well, absolutely. So, of course, quick as a flash, I got these guys to go and see Rufus. And we had him tested. And we removed all the toxicity and all the sensitivities that we could possibly do from his diet. And he got no better. He got no better at all. In fact, he carried on deteriorating. But these people, these um, doctors, had got phenomenal tendrils into, uh, in, into the medical world and put us in touch with other doctors who had got different specialisms and, and different uh, skills. And within a very, very short space of time, Rufus got diagnosed with Lyme, Bartonella, multiple co-infections, and suddenly we'd got a handle for what had gone wrong with him. Suddenly we'd got something to treat. Well, I thought no more about that because I thought we were on a fairly straightforward journey where we, where we put the treatments in place and sooner or later he, he'll, he'll recover. Unfortunately, we were already in some senses a touch too late because his sensitivities developed the, to the point that he could eat or drink almost nothing. And he lost about three stone in weight and carried on deteriorating. And our strategy was trying to build him up, up in order and in hope of him being able to take other treatments, antibiotics and so on, to try and help with this illness. Well, we did get there eventually. We did get there eventually and he's being treated today. But during that journey, and I'm only going back now three months, my ex-wife who is sitting here had, uh, has had ill health for some time. In fact, the whole family has had varying aspects of ill health, including myself. 
um, ranging from Rufus at the very serious end to me, I would say at the very mild end because about four years ago, I did a charity cycle ride from Land's End to John O'Groats, got two or three viruses and ended up what I self-diagnosed, probably totally incorrectly, as a mild form of ME. Um, and, it, and it really just, it didn't change my life, but it, di it, it stopped me from exercising anything like the intensity that I'd been able to uh, for a while. But Kate had the test, positive. Well, I'm quite shocked now, you know, that two people in my family have got Lyme disease. So Rebecca, who had got some sort of symptoms that I was learning now were potential symptoms of Lyme, got tested, three out of three. And then it was, was it you, Libby, or me, me. Then it was me, that was four out of four. Then it was Libby, five out of five. I'd been told for some time by most people, and, and the conventional wisdom was, it's only transmitted by the bite of a tick. Well, I'm starting to think, this is impossible because none of us know of any tick bites anyway, let alone all five of us. And we've never been on holiday together for a long, it just didn't make any sense. But we then decide, decide to start testing the extended family. And we get to six out of six, seven out of seven, eight out of eight, nine out of nine, we're now 10 out of 12. <laughs> and although the other two have tested negative, I still suspect those tests because I, I don't know how the hell they managed to escape it. <laughs> and, and, and if they did, it's not fair, is it, really? <laughs> although it's nice to have two sane members of the family, really, so, <laughs> or semi-sane. Um, so, but all, all of this time, you know, the impact that it's having on me from a point of view of thinking about the outside world, and the outside world, I mean all of you people, you know, I was just staggered because I put on, on my Facebook, I put five out of five of my family have Lyme. This was about five or six weeks ago. The response from the Lyme community was staggering, but also the press suddenly got massively interested in it. And I started getting phone calls from all the TV companies and everybody wanting to interview me and wanting to know about it. And I realized at this moment that this was another crusade, another something else that I had to own. I've been trying to own disability in the UK and autism and trying to make those children's lives better. But I suddenly realized that this Lyme situation was such a travesty of justice and so treatable that something had to be done. And the more I got the letters through from people, the more I read, the more I realized that it got to be congenital. It probably got to be sexually transmitted. And who knows what else? All I knew, all I knew instinctively, but of course can't prove, but I think probably Dr. Klinghart could, but uh, is that it's not just passed on by a tick. There are lots of other methodologies. And it's just devastating the way this country has been let down. Well, not this country, the world, because the letters come from all over, from Australia, from America, from Austria, from Holland, everywhere. And the devastation it's causing has driven me to want to really do something. So as to what that something is, I've got a very, very clear strategy of what I need to achieve. How I get there, I'm not quite sure yet, but what I need to achieve is to convince the very top of the government that this is an absolute, utter medical disgrace. And whichever politician decides that they can live with this medical disgrace is probably going to get exposed in the future to derision that they allowed this to happen on their watch. Now that will only happen if they'd got good reason to understand the severity of the problem. So my challenge is to make sure whichever prime minister is in power, whether it's David Cameron, and I would hope it's to be him, even though it's only got another 12 months to go, is so aware of this disease that if he doesn't do something about it, he could go down in the history books as the guy that neglected one of the greatest medical travesties that there's been. And that's my mission. And how do I get there? Well, once again, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but it starts with, uh, with the chief executive that I'm recruiting and I'm interviewing next week. 
this person will be my powerhouse who can gather all the data, gather all the information and start lobbying and start making things happen. And what I'm really hoping, somewhat maybe optimistically, but you know, I am prepared to put a lot, a lot of effort behind this. So maybe optimistically, but I hope not, that I'm going to create somewhere in that bureaucratic organization that sits above us ruling our lives and at such an awareness of this illness that they won't even dare to ignore it anymore and to not study it. That is my mission. That is what I'm committed to. And what other aspects to Lyme disease that I take on in the meantime, whether it's setting up a, a laboratory in the UK that can test properly for it, whether it's setting up a clinic that can treat, I don't know about those peripheral bits, but what I have to do is change the medical profession at the top of this country to do proper tests, to take it seriously and want to expose it. Thank you, thank you. And th th this, is, this is something that I can't let go of because it's not only a phenomenal humanitar humanitarian cause in my mind, like Cordwell Children was, but unlike Cordwell Children, which I'll remain completely dedicated to for the rest of my life, unlike Cordwell Children, I was never touched by the problems that Cordwell Children helps. With Lyme disease, my, well, I didn't realize I was touched, of course, because I didn't realize my son had got it, but with Lyme disease, my son has lost 10 phenomenal years of his life. Phenomenal years. They could have been, he had the world at his fingertips. And the rest of my family are suffering. So not only have I got a humanitarian cause, but I've also got a phenomenal personal cause paralleling that at the same time. So thank you all for listening. It is a privilege to be here. And, you know, I've said on Facebook a few times that the biggest privilege or the biggest positive of Lyme disease is that I've never witnessed such a humanitarian group of people who are suffering and almost dying themselves and yet want to help others. And in some respects, you know, it's a real privilege to be part of that group. Well, I'm hoping to leave you very soon. <laughs>